do you find perspective teaching videos are either so basic that they don't seem to relate to the buildings you see in real life? Or they're so complicated, they're no help in understanding perspective at all. Because perspective is all about how something looks from a particular viewing location, it should be no surprise that the first key point is we must find the eye level because our viewpoint is created by where our eyes are when we're looking at something or where the camera is when it takes a photo. Here's how I find eye level. When we look at a building straight on, we see all these horizontal lines. But even when the building's more complicated, we can still see that there are lines which are either actual horizontal lines in the building or they're points where various architectural elements line up, such as the tops of these columns in a horizontal line, the tops of these arches, the tops of these two domes, the tops of these small towers. But when the building is turned away from us, all of these horizontal lines start to slope. And if we line up these same architectural elements, the lines become angled. But the quick and easy way I use to find eye level uses the fact that at eye level, we still have a horizontal line. Let me use a simpler structure to show you. Here we have a small gatehouse that we're looking at from an angle. So therefore we can see we don't have any horizontal lines that go across our building. But if we look carefully, we can see that these ones at the top of our structure angle in this direction and the ones at the bottom of our structure angle in this direction. And what that tells us is that at some point these angles change from going downwards to going upwards and the point where they change direction will be a horizontal line. And there may actually be a line on our building at that point or there may be some architectural elements that line up at that point or there might not. But that place where our lines that angle down and our lines that angle up meet in a horizontal line will be our eye level. And by saying that, I simply mean the level of the eyes of the person looking at this structure or the level of the camera lens when it took the photo. So here I can see that this angle is still sloping up slightly. I can see that this angle is sloping down. This angle is sloping up less than this one eye level is going to be about here. If someone were walking past this structure, because it's flat ground and I was standing on the same level of ground, their eyes, if they are the same height as I am, would be about here. And that's about right when we look at the scale of this building. The other important thing to realize is that eye level affects the entire scene, not just the building that we might be focused on. So in this gate, this angle here gives us an indication that eye level is going to be above that. It's important to be able to find eye level because everything to do with perspective hinges on the level of our eyes when we're looking at the scene. And we'll look at the most important of those things in our second point. But before we do that, we'll just find eye level in a range of situations so we can see just how varied a place it might be in any scene we're looking at. This scene shows us probably the most common way will come across eye level. We can see there are lots of horizontal lines that are angled with perspective on this facade. Clearly, eye level is not up here. These lines are nowhere near horizontal. As they come lower and lower, we can line up these bands in the stonework. It's almost horizontal here. It's about here. And that makes sense because the ground is flat and I'm standing at the same level as these people down here. So this is a really common place to find eye level at the bottom of our scene. But if we look at this scene and we try and find where's the horizontal line, well, obviously this line is sloping upwards, this line is sloping downwards, so it's somewhere in between. This line is still sloping downwards, upwards, upwards, downwards. It's somewhere in between these two lines. It's going to be about here. So it's certainly not at the bottom of our street. And that's because I'm in an upper story window looking out. So my eye level is higher against these buildings than the people in the street. Here's another example where clearly eye level is going to be higher than this line and lower than this one. Now this line still slightly slopes up. 
This is looking more like it. And it's so high because I'm at the top of a very long flight of stairs when I'm holding the camera to take this photo. And so this is the level of my camera and most of the scene is below the level of my camera. So eye level is not just at the bottom, although that's more common, is not just in the middle, it can be quite high up in a scene. If we're looking at this scene, we can see that these lines are angled steeply, less steeply, less steeply, but in fact, we don't really have any horizontal lines. So eye level is going to be above what we can see in this picture. And that's because I'm in a very tall tower in Berlin, looking out over the city. And because it's a very flat area, I'm actually higher even than what we see in the very distance. So there is still an eye level in this scene. And we discover that because the lines only go in one direction. We don't have any lines that tilt this way. When we look at a scene such as this, we find the same thing. Our perspective lines or tilt and there is no horizontal line. There are two possible reasons why we can't find the horizontal line in this photo. One of them is that if we go far enough down this tower, we will find it. But the photo has been cropped and so we've lost that part of the photo. But the second reason is that the camera was tilted upwards. So we'll now look at our second point. And that will make clear why it's so important to be able to find eye level when we want to draw a building with the perspective accurately represented. For our second point, I need you to think of a fan. But the fan I'm talking about doesn't have to be this fancy. I'm thinking of something that's more like this. Let me show you why I find this the most helpful concept of all when I'm drawing perspective lines. We talked about the importance to find eye level. And in this scene, eye level was about here. So let's draw a horizontal line. After I've located eye level, the horizontal line, I like to locate what the highest, steepest line above eye level is, or at least the most obvious one. And that's this one. And that's going to be at about that angle. And then I go the other direction and I find the line that angles in the other direction the steepest, which is this one, which is going to be like that. And there's another one in between in this case. And what I want you to see is that these perspective angles form a fan shape. Now we know from all those other perspective videos that if we continue these perspective lines, they will all meet on eye level, on the horizontal line, in this case, on that line. But often that point is off the paper, sometimes by a very long way. It's not usually a helpful thing to focus on when we're drawing. What I like to focus on is getting the upper angle correct, the lowest angle correct, locating where eye level is because that's going to be a horizontal line. And then I know that every perspective angle that's in this building is going to fan out in each direction above and below the eye level line. And so I imagine a fan laid over the top of my drawing and I align the horizontal line with eye level about here in this case. And now when I'm drawing, I know that these perspective angles have to conform to this pattern. They have to fit in either being greater or lesser of an angle than the lines on each side. And because I'm looking out, for this fan shape pattern in all of my lines, let's say I'm going to draw a line in here. If I get it wrong, it's obviously wrong if I'm looking for the pattern because it doesn't fit between this line and this line. The angle doesn't fan out between there and there, but it runs diagonally across the gap. And so by looking for the pattern, it becomes clear that this line is in the wrong place. It doesn't fit the pattern. The most common mistake I see in perspective angles is drawings where instead of fanning out in a fan shape, the lines are parallel. And of course, we can't get a fan out of parallel lines because parallel lines will never meet at a common point. 
Now if we're looking at our scene and trying to see the, the fan shape, we locate our horizontal line, our eye level, which was about here. And then above that, our perspective lines fan in increasing angles upwards. And below this, our perspective lines fan in increasing levels downwards. And in this particular scene, our horizontal line is about midway with the whole scene, not with these buildings, but with the whole scene. But that's not always the case. If we think back to this scene, then our horizontal line is right down near the bottom of our scene. And there's only in fact a couple of lines that angle downwards from that. And in fact, there are lots of lines that fan outwards, upwards. So while finding eye level is important because it tells us which of our perspective lines will fan in increasingly in one direction and how many perspective lines will fan increasingly in the other direction, the eye level is not necessarily in the middle. It may be right down the bottom of our fan or it could be right up the top depending on the view. And if we think back to a scene such as this, then our lines are going to fan outwards but there will be no horizontal line but the fan pattern is so helpful because it keeps reminding me that every one of these lines as I move away from eye level has to change angle slightly has to change angle slightly and because it changes angle slightly it becomes slightly greater in angle that creates the fan shape that tilts the line so that it's not parallel but that it's further away from the neighboring line at the top than it is at the bottom. Let's look at a photo we haven't seen yet. Where is our horizontal line? Well, clearly these angles are increasing upwards. So the horizontal line is going to be below these. This line here is also still sloping downwards, but not very much compared to the lines above. So we're getting closer to our horizontal line if I look at this line here, it's very close to being horizontal, but it's actually sloping downwards in the opposite direction to these ones. And I can see that with these other lines I have in the diagram, the angle is increasing. So eye level is going to be about here. And you might be saying, those ladies' eyes are nowhere near there. And that's because if you notice this ground is sloping downwards, I'm further away than possibly you think. The ground has sloped down more and I'm actually at a lower level. My feet and therefore my eyes are at a lower level than this lady's. So here we have a fan shape that's looking a bit like this where there aren't many angles below our horizontal eye level and there's quite a few above. And when we're drawing extreme perspective, it can be very difficult to make ourselves draw these lines that are so steep an angle. And I think this is why we become tempted to make the lines parallel because we get nervous to draw what's actually in front of us. But as I'm establishing these perspective angled lines, I'm always making sure that I'm creating the fan shape, that whatever line is beneath it, there is a larger gap here than here, creating this fan shape above eye level and below eye level. Now what's our, our first third? two key points basically concerned horizontal lines. Our third key point concerns vertical lines and this scene is a good example. And the key point is, as an object moves further away, it becomes more and more visually compressed. So this building is in effect moving away from us. This part of it is much closer to us than this part up here. In practice, what this means is that on the side of a building that slopes away from us, any architectural details which would be of equal size and equally spaced if we were to look at them straight on, those spaces, those gaps, those objects become narrower and narrower as the building moves further away from us. So these arches we know are all the same size but they become narrower and narrower and narrower from this angle. It's not just the arches but it's the gaps between the arches that also we know are the same width but as they move away from us, they become narrower and narrower. We can see this principle easily in this colonnade. And even though this side is not moving away from us 
at a very steep angle, we can still clearly see that the gap between this column and this column is a lot wider than the gap between this column and this column, even though we know that in real life they're equally spaced. And when the angle of a wall that moves away from us is greater, giving us a more extreme view, then this visual compression happens faster because the wall moves further away from us in less distance. And so the effect is multiplied. And we can see that here in the distance between these two columns and these two columns. And it's not just columns and windows that are affected. Here we have a magnificent section of stone carving. This pattern is repeated and continues for a long distance up this balustrade. And here we see looking up the entire length, but in fact the halfway point of this balustrade is here. And we can see that easily by checking the most prominent parts of the pattern. And of course this affects decorations that may be on those surfaces. But this is an effect we see constantly and easily in large buildings. And this is an important principle to get right, because whereas a building might look like this, if we don't get it right, our building will look more like this. Although the perspective angles are all correct, by not compressing the wall and therefore the objects on it as it moves further away, we stretch it out a lot further than it should be. And because we haven't narrowed the windows adequately, their proportions have changed. So a clearly rectangular window is looking more like a square window at the other end. Let me show you a really quick exercise to do to get an understanding of just how much this visual compression affects our drawing. If we think of a rectangle and we want to find the halfway point of that rectangle, then it's simple enough to draw our diagonal lines. But that gives us the halfway point. If I'd drawn my rectangle a little more exactly and I'd put my diagonals more carefully in the right place. But this is an easy way to find the halfway point along the side of this rectangle. But if we draw a rectangle that's moving away from us, but we can see here that the second half of our rectangle is actually only a fraction of the distance of the first half of our rectangle. If we tilt our rectangle more sharply, we can see in fact that the halfway point is even further towards one side. Now let's picture this with some architectural elements on it. And let's put five columns. So now we'll tilt this wall away from us. And here's our halfway point. Here's our end point. And here's our closest point. Now we need to put another column in each. But instead of trying to guess, let's take this now as a separate shape. That gives me this as the halfway spot from here to here. And I'll do the same thing here. The distance between the columns gets narrower and narrower. Now if we were to do our columns on a more extremely tilted wall, so there's our halfway point, here's our end point, here's our first point. And here we see it again happening. And this is one of the biggest problems I see in the perspective of architectural and streetscape drawings. That this compression, the perspective word for it is foreshortening, that this foreshortening doesn't happen or it doesn't happen quickly enough. So when I'm looking at a scene in front of me or at a photo, knowing in a theoretical sense what's going to happen lets me observe it more carefully, more accurately in my reference. And that then gives me a better chance of capturing it accurately in my drawing because I probably can't draw very well what I haven't actually seen. So knowing these three key points 
helps me to find and observe the most important detail I need to capture in my observation and in my mind before I put pen to paper. And in my experience, that's actually a bigger challenge than actually drawing it because we can't draw what we haven't seen. I'm Stephen Travis. I hope this has been helpful to you. Why not stop worrying about boxes on lines and vanishing points and work at considering these three key points when you're looking at a scene to draw it and see if spending just a few moments mapping this out helps you to do a better drawing. So have fun with your drawing. I'll see you next time. Bye.